Hey everyone, this is Paul, and in this video, I'm going to be describing what numbers actually are. Now, on the face of it, this may not seem all that related to some of the themes on this channel, but I'm making this video to address some common misconceptions about numbers and infinity in particular when we get to talking about infinity, because I sometimes see misleading arguments, often arguing for atheism, that tend to rest on a fundamental misunderstanding of infinity and numbers. And I think this misunderstanding comes from several philosophers who don't cite the relevant mathematical literature around numbers, and I'm guessing this is just due to their unfamiliarity with it. So unfortunately, I feel the need to make this video because while mathematicians and analysts in particular have done a lot of good work trying to rigorously define numbers and infinity, I think some philosophers ignore these developments and as a result, end up making some elementary mistakes when discussing them. So I am really going to go after the ideas that some of these people put forward, at least hopefully in a nice way, because I think some of them are actually misleading people to come to wrong conclusions. So if you're watching this video, hopefully you won't be misled and you'll better understand what is going on. So right off the bat, well, what the heck are numbers? Well, typically numbers are defined as abstract mathematical objects that are used to measure, count, and label. Now this doesn't quite tell us what they are, but it does kind of tell us what their purpose is, so to speak. And I'd argue this does kind of help us get an idea of what they need to do. So in order to count, measure, and label, we're gonna need three things. We're first gonna need objects themselves, things to count with. We're gonna need operators that allow us to combine and relate these objects, and this is operators such as addition and multiplication. And then lastly, we need an order for these numbers and their relationships so that we can kind of put them in this greater than, less than configuration. And this is necessary because we wanna actually do things with these numbers and represent relations of them. You could argue, you know, the words on a page, they have an order, but clearly these aren't numbers because you can't combine them and, and measure them and add them together in a way that you can with what we think of when we think of our numbers. So let's start with this first part, the objects themselves. This is arguably the most difficult piece. You know, what the heck are these objects? And to get started, we need to make a distinction between a number itself and the object or symbol we use to represent it, which is often called the numeral. So the numerals can include things like the Arabic numeral three, the English word three, and then three tally marks. Each of these all refer to the same number, the same mathematical object. They're just different ways of representing it. So let's not get confused between how a number is represented and what the number itself actually is. Now this is really weird because how can such purely abstract things like a number three, not the numeral, but the actual number three exist? If no humans existed, we probably wouldn't have symbols like the Arabic numeral three, but collections such as three apples falling from a tree or atoms with three protons like lithium could still exist. So the question is whether this relationship of three exists outside of human observers. And this leads to a debate of whether mathematics and mathematical objects more generally is invented by humans or something that already exists that we're simply discovering. Now, many theologians and philosophers have suggested that numbers exist in the mind of God. And this is basically the same as what is called mathematical Platonism, which says that abstract ideas and objects like the number three exist in a non-spatiotemporal, non-physical abstract realm, and that there are true mathematical sentences that express true descriptions of such objects. This is contrasted with other views such as formalism, which basically says mathematics is kind of like a game of chess where you have rules and the rules end up giving rise to certain strategies, but these strategies don't really exist. They just kind of fall out of the rules that people have defined, so to speak. And then lastly, you have this view called nominalism, which actually says that mathematical objects such as numbers and sets and circles do not really exist. And this is interesting. Davis and Hirsch in their 1999 book, The Mathematical Experience, say that most mathematicians act as though they are Platonists, even though if pressed to defend this position carefully, they may retreat to formalism. And one of the big arguments that you see against formalism is what's called the no miracles argument. Why is it that mathematics and mathematical results are so useful and even beautiful, especially when it comes to the natural sciences and engineering, if we were simply making these things up, making up the rules as we went? You can see Wigner's paper on this for more details. And perhaps for this reason, this is why most philosophers of mathematics, according to the Phil Papers survey, actually lean towards mathematical Platonism, despite the fact that most philosophers in general do not. I mean, this isn't you know the biggest sample size, but it is an interesting result that people actually studying philosophy of mathematics tend to lean more towards Platonism. Regardless of your view on the actual ontology of mathematical objects like numbers, 
numbers are often seen as set elements. So to get to this point, it's worth pointing out that it was the mathematician Gerhard Cantor who sort of started set theory and kicked it off. And as an aside, Cantor was actually a devout Lutheran and he believed that some of his results were sort of communicated to him by God. And ironically, there were some Christian theologians at the time who saw his theories of transfinite numbers as actually endorsing some sort of pantheism, which Cantor obviously vigorously rejected. Now, regardless, Cantor laid the groundwork for what are now rigorous axiomatic definitions of numbers as set elements. Now, we're not gonna need to get into the specifics or metaphysics of set theory itself, at least not yet, but rather it's important to understand the set theoretic development because this has been the way that mathematics and mathematical analysts have gone to define numbers, at least in more recent times. So to build up numbers, we're gonna start with these sort of sets or unordered collections of things. And we end up getting these three popular sets that we often think of when we think of numbers. One of them being the positive integers. This is just elements one, two, three, so on and so forth. You have the non-negative integers, which is just the positive integers and zero. And then you have the integers in general, which have positive and negative one, two, three, and of course, minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on and so on. With each one being sort of a subset of the previous one as well. So the integers, of course, contain the non-negative integers, which contain the positive integers. Now let's move on to the actual operators that we need to combine and relate these objects, because currently all we have are sets or unordered collections of things. So we need some additional stuff to make these things numbers and allow us to do things like add and subtract. And this brings us to the idea of fields. Now a field is a set of elements that contains two operators called addition and multiplication, which satisfy the field axioms. There are 11 field axioms, five for addition, five for multiplication, and then one for sort of distribution across both multiplication and addition. And we do this so we can define addition and multiplication rigorously and axiomatically. So the field axioms for addition, and I won't go through all of these in detail, but I am gonna list them because we'll come back to them later when we need to, when we start talking about infinity. So if you wanna take a look, you can pause, and they basically go like this. They have all sorts of names. You have your closure, and then standard stuff you might've learned in elementary school like commutivity and associativity. Similarly, you have your five field axioms for multiplication. These also have you know, very similar names. You have closure and of course, commutivity and associativity. I mean, if you, if you can kind of decompose this language, you'll often see that a lot of this stuff is the way you would expect them to be. Like, you know, you multiply from one side and it doesn't matter which side you multiply a number by, you get the same result either way, so on and so forth. So these are the field axioms for multiplication. And then you have your distributive law, which is number 11, which just basically states how multiplication and addition should distribute among these operations as you would expect. So this is just all kind of standard stuff, but once again, rigorously trying to define this in a logical manner. But this still isn't enough to get us to numbers. And why is this? Because we can't compare numbers to tell us which one is larger. We need order. We need some way of ordering these numbers to tell us that some are larger than others. So for the third piece, we're gonna need to define an order. And this leads us to the idea of an ordered set. Now, an ordered set is a set plus this relation called an order that satisfies the following four properties. And it needs to satisfy three, but you need the fourth one to get a total ordering. And they have you know, their own fancy names like reflexivity, anti-symmetry, and comparability. But really, once again, this is just sort of trying to really make it rigorous what we mean by having an order and, and some function of two numbers that returns the larger one, these sorts of things. So the question, is this enough to get numbers? Well, actually not quite, because we could still have things where one is less than two, but one plus three is greater than two. So this brings us to the idea of an ordered field. And as Baby Rudin tells us, an ordered field is a field F, which is also an ordered set, but has the additional two properties. And this is what we need to get an ordered field. And these are pretty much very standard properties that hopefully make a lot of sense that basically says, hey, look, if X, Y, and Z are an F, and Y is less than Z, then X plus Y is gonna be less than X plus Z. This is you know, hopefully pretty standard, pretty obvious stuff. And then some stuff that, that satisfies the relation between positive and negative numbers. And once again, to have a field, you need both positive and negative numbers so that you can have your additive inverses. Now, there are two examples of ordered fields that are worth talking about. You have your rational numbers, which are just ratios of integers as long as your denominator is not zero. We'll talk about division by zero in another video. And then you have what is perhaps the most common, which are your real numbers, which is really just the closure of your rational numbers, which really is the same thing as taking your rational numbers and taking the union of that with all of its limit points. So you can think of this as the rationals with all of the gaps like the square root of two actually filled. This is how you get 
your real numbers that we always talk about. And notice here you have your sort of subsets here where your rational numbers are a subset of the reals, your integers are a subset of your rational numbers, and so on and so forth. It can actually be shown that any complete ordered field is isomorphic to the real numbers. So the real numbers are kind of the one that we typically use when we talk about numbers. And as a result, we now get to our final definition of what a number is. A number is an element of an ordered field. Now the reals are clearly an example of an ordered field. The integers, including the positive integers, are of course elements of the reals, even though the set of integers and the set of positive integers are not themselves ordered fields, they are sort of subsets of what is an ordered field. So this explains how numbers are defined in terms of set theory, but what the heck are numbers really? And to be honest, we don't really know. However, while we may not know what numbers are, we can certainly say that whatever they are, infinity is not one of them. And that's gonna be the topic of the next video. So anyway, Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.